Good morning. We had uh, three topics submitted to talk about today. And uh, one was languages, record displays, and diacritics. Another was how do folks keep up with what's new and happening in the cataloging world? And then uh, some authorities questions, I think that Bruce would like to talk about and discuss. Um, I found in Bugzilla some bugs that are about languages and diacritics and I'll put a couple of links in the chat. Um, this one deals with how records in non-Latin scripts are handled. They often have 880 fields and sometimes they lack 245s, which can be a little weird and tricky. I just signed off on that and hopefully that patch will advance. This is something in discussion, so might be good for people to take a look at and chime in about the advanced search languages system preference. And that's a system preference where you can limit the advanced search languages in the advanced search to whatever you'd like, actually. Um, and I looked up the link in the manual about that system preference. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Then when looking at Bugzilla, I found there were a lot of bugs if you just searched advanced search languages. And this might sound more opac -y, but I think it's something for catalogers to really take a look at because uh, you know, if we have collections in different languages that use diacritics in non-English languages, and I know in my library, we have a lot of Spanish, Japanese, we have Cyrillic, then making sure that these materials are findable is something I think it's really good for catalogers to keep an eye on. And those are some things that I found that might be good for folks to take a look at. I'm sorry, Heather, I don't see any of the um, links in the chat. Oh, gosh, I think Thank you so much. I don't think I had it set correctly to everyone. Let's try now. Are you all seeing those? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks so much for letting me know that, Valerie. So that's, that's about it for things I found. So, uh, Let's open it up for, for chatting and discussion. Do folks have any questions about any of these topics or things they'd like to bring up having to do with cataloging of non-English materials, diacritics, or keeping up with, how do you keep up with what's going on in cataloging in the cataloging world? And especially with Koha, I mean, besides Bugzilla, I know I look at discussion lists a lot, the main Koha list. Um, I actually, I also monitor AutoCAT, uh, OCLC discussion lists, because that's where there's a lot of announcements. Hi, Heather. Um, this is Ian. I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, if not addressed here, maybe uh, we do another time. It's something about a macro in advanced editor. Um, I, whenever I create one, then the next time when I log back in, it disappeared. My macro disappeared. So I, I just don't know. Uh, because, you know, on the conference, like a few days, not a week ago, uh, one of the uh, guy 
showed us how to uh, his how he did his the macro. So I I follow his instruction and I did that. And but the second day when I log back into my Koha, my macro is not there. Yes, this is a known issue. It has to do with your browser settings. Um, okay. And there is a development in Bugzilla in the works to okay. uh, make the macro settings be kept between uh, between sessions. So I'm taking a look at the macros are kept in the browser, not in Co not placed in Koha. Correct. That would be something nice to do. Yeah. So I have first of all, I'm looking up on YouTube the recording of that session from the Koha US conference about the advanced cataloging editor because it was fantastic. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to get the link in the chat. Put that there. It was absolutely fantastic. I recommend it to everyone who uses or would like to use the advanced bibliographic editor. I mean, I use it a lot and I still learned. And yeah, um, in the chat, Margaret mentions she can only get the macros to work in Chrome, not Firefox. I have my Firefox browser set to uh, keep a lot of the cookies. It has to do, I believe, with keeping the cookies and so that they can be saved there from session to session. And let's see if I can oh, find okay. in Bugzilla. Because I, just, I clear my cookie every, at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Oh, okay, that's something to do with cookies. I don't even know that. Yeah. So let's see. Here we go. Uh, the bug is called Advanced Cataloging Editor Rancor. Macros are lost when browser storage cleared. I'll put the link to that one in the chat. Okay. And that patch is being pushed to master for 20.05, but it's not backported to 19.11. Okay. One thing I do with my macros too is I try to be sure to save them. I, I like to put them up on the Koha Wiki. I don't know if people are familiar. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's a great place for uh, macros. And then I know that they're saved. Um, and then I also keep them in a separate text file on my computer because whenever my browser settings are changed a little bit or, you know, I need to clear the browser cache if we get an upgrade, mm -hmm. then, then I lose the macros because we're still on 1911. We're not on 2005 yet. Okay. Um, we got a question. Is it true that Coho works better in Firefox? Um, I find for me, it works equally well in Firefox and Chrome, but uh, it so much has to do with your operating system, with the version of a browser you have. I, I like Firefox's privacy settings and user control. Well, I like Chrome, um, and I, I don't have any trouble with Koha in Chrome but I mainly stick with it because of the macros. Can't lose my macros. I love them too much. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think a lot of it has to do with how you're able to set the settings on your individual devices with your operating system. Uh, and another thing, another big drawback about them being kept in the browser right now is that that's only on a particular device. And my little uh, laptop that I'm working on at home only has the macros that I've added to it since I've been working at home. And if I go into the library to work at my big computer, 
there they all are, and it just makes me sad. And I do, I do have, <laughs> I did make a Word document with all of them in it, so I can add them if I if I need to. <laughs> yeah, I, this is gonna I bring them. I'm gonna make a pitch again to put your macros on the Coho Wiki to share. It's it's a place that we can all access from any device, and uh, even if they're not tested, even if you just use them just i mean you can you can throw them up there and the way i first learned how to do it was copying yours from the wiki oh i'm glad <laughs> it's nice to hear that that's useful yeah i'm i'm looking forward to upgrading to 20.05 so that they could be saved and i can really rather than spending my time replacing the ones and copying and pasting i could spend some time making some more Thank you all, though. I'm sorry you interrupt your whatever no. your party is going to do today. Thank you for bringing it up because it's something that so many of us are working with and wrestling with and trying to figure out. Yeah, knowing they're kept in the browser is going to save me an extended period of uh, forehead bashing. <laughs> exactly. Well, Bruce, you had some authority questions? Well, uh, we discussed one earlier. Uh, I was questioning the value of the early works to 1800 that I see in so many topical authorities on Library of Congress. And I finally tracked it down. It turns out it's an artifact of the Great Fire of 1812. Um, so that, that explains why what that's doing there and why they picked 1800 out of their hat. Uh, the other question I have is, uh, Doing automatic generation of uh, links, it always strips out the final uh, punctuation. Is there a way to g make it not do that? There's a bug about that too. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, knowing there's a bug is enough. <laughs> so it's it's not a it's not something I'm doing wrong, <clears throat> and it's something no. that's going to get fixed someday. That's the, the some list of uh, authorities problems I've got this month. Yeah, I'm looking. I mean, that's one reason why I haven't turned on the automatic generation. Well, we use it because we're we're such a peculiar collection, and we're starting from scratch. Uh, I passed forty three hundred volumes this week. Hey. <laughs> it takes a while when you only got uh, can budget time for five books a day. Special collections cataloging takes time. Well, it's, it could be worse. Uh, only about twenty percent of my volumes have to be original cataloging. I can, I've got a list of uh, thirty Z thirty nine fifty sources, and somebody's got most of the stuff. Uh, let me let me add that uh, not everybody. Uh, that's running a Z3950 is uh, using the same encoding system. And I got a lot of entries early on that had uh, question mark characters instead of uh, uh, the correct symbols. And uh, <clears throat> by changing them from UTF-8 to Mark-8, I think it is, I fixed uh, all the ones I ran into. And uh, bringing in the, the bringing in the diacriticals so I don't have to recreate them is a big help. If that's, uh, if you're, if you're importing diacriticals, that's something to watch for. Definitely. And one thing I really enjoy about participating in this group is that it gives me an opportunity to learn more about certain things. And that's something that I had come across when looking into how Koha handles diacritics and special characters is that the UTF-8 encoding supports 
many more characters correctly than Mark 8. I think I found that bug about authorities and punctuation. Put that in the chat. If nobody else has another item, let me ask this. I've got some things that got put into the early records that is wrong. <laughs> and uh, I could do a bulk uh, change if I knew how to. Now, is that something I need to learn Mark Edit for? Um, tell me more about this. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, the encoding scheme. It got put in as LCC when it should be Augustine Society Library, because we're strange. Um, and being able to go in and, and uh, correct those in bulk would uh, save me an awful lot of keystrokes. Well, the, there is that fairly recent feature of the mark modification templates. Okay. Um, and I was looking at a video that Equinox did which brings up another place I learn a lot of cataloging things is YouTube. And let me see if I can find a link to that video. Terry Reese also has utterly fantastic videos on YouTube about Mark edit. Yeah, I have. I haven't decided to climb that learning curve yet, but uh, I, I keep getting these messages that it's in my future. It's Mark edit is very useful and very powerful. I I too though am a a complete beginner with it. Hmm, let me see. I'm on the Equinox website trying to find that video. It might, I might be misremembering that it was on YouTube. So, let's see. I found a Bywater blog post about mark modification templates in Koha. Okay. The, the batch editing options are getting pretty powerful. And my thinking so far on it is although uh, it may not be as slick as Mark Edit. You don't have to export and import. Yeah. But on the other hand, you are really doing it to your records live. Export and play in Mark Edit means if it doesn't work out, you're not really touching your records. Yeah. I've, my system backs up every Sunday, so I do weird stuff on Monday, so I don't. Ah. Really <laughs> Yeah, look into that. Yeah, let us know how it goes. Yeah, we'll.
Let's see, how, how about uh, everybody else? So we have a question here um, about the bug I played with in the sandbox during the conference. Yes, yes, what about it? Um, can you really do that? A different image for each item. And if you did that, do you have to change the whole, everything to that or and turn off your automatically generated images or can you just do it? It looks like with this, uh, this development being written that you would be able to put individual items images for an individual item and still have an image for the whole bibliographic record also and still be able to pull items automatically. Oh. We have that would, that would be um, awesome. Yes, it really would. We have uh, we pull images automatically using the um, I don't know how to say it, Cosi server, Kochi, Kosi. Um, and we upload a lot of images to our records too. And when we've uploaded something, it overrides that automatic polling. So we get the images we've uploaded to the bibliographic record. But we have, being a, a museum collection, we often have different printing states or we've got one copy with an autograph or some manuscript notations. And it would be fantastic to be able to associate some images with the particular copy and have that online for people to look at rather than having to pull the books. Yeah, that would be great. We have, we have a metal detector and we've made a, a very specific record for that metal detector. And now somebody has given us another metal detector that's completely different from the first one. So now we want to have kind of a generic record and put both of them on it. And it'd be great to be able to have a picture of each one so people could choose which one they wanted to check out if it, if it matters. I don't know anything about metal detectors, but. But then if we got another one, if somebody gave us a third one, then we could just add it on. Exactly. Let me see if I can find that uh, link to that bug number and put it in the chat. Hi, Fred, glad you joined I, us. Yes, I suddenly realized, yeah, it is the first Thursday. We're... Sorry, Pat Pat. <laughs> no big deal, it's casual. Hey, I'm wearing a shirt. All right. We're just pretty much having a general chat this time. We chatted a little bit about diacritics and record displays, uh, but, and uh, different Q&A. Um, and uh, a question had been brought asking folks, how do you keep up with things in the cataloging world and new developments? Uh, I'm supposed to keep up? <laughs> I'm fortunate enough that um, we may be get we may get a couple hundred books a year. Um, I'm just treading water. I think a lot of us are. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but next week there's a really great webinar on um, critical cataloging, um, hosted by. Um, I think it's called Be Here. Um, so it's kind of that concept of radical cataloging and incorporating more um, terms that are better for BIPOC um, in your cataloging. Sounds fantastic. I hadn't heard about it. Could you put the information in the uh, chat? Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. That should take you to the page. Oh, it's sold out, but. Well, perhaps they'd put up a recording or something later. Yeah. Yeah. Can I 
ask you guys a question about, um, and we were talking about languages earlier, um, but have you ever created uh, linked cataloging records in Koha? Um, I had a title that was published in Japanese, and when I tried to bring the record in, Koha kind of yelled at me because there were two 245s and this is exactly what I was talking about with records that often have 880 fields. Um, yeah, uh, it's very important to bring them in as UTF-8. Okay. And I can put a couple of links in the chat to records we have in our Koha catalog with them and how they look. They're very weird. First, I'll put in the bug with um, item level cover images. And Caitlin, were you trying to bring that record in via Z3950? Um, no, I was trying to create it myself. Um, there, there were no records available for it through the databases we had selected for our Z3950. Yeah. So I was just trying to recreate it myself looking at WorldCat, so. <laughs> So this is a link to our OPAC of a record that I've been using for testing. It's pretty much as it was brought in from OCLC with the 880 fields. And if you take a look at the mark, you'll see that it has no 245 whatsoever because the non-Latin character data was mapped into an 880 at the bottom of the record with a subfield C that says 245-00. Oh, okay. The real record in our catalog, we actually really do own that item. I did a little tweak, tweaking to get it to behave correctly because of the bug concerning the 880 fields. See you, Yen. Thank you for joining us and bringing great questions. Here we go. Here's the real item in our catalog with some of the 880 information copied into a 245 to get it to behave better. Okay. I'll have to try that. Yeah, the UTF-8 has nothing to do then if you're, if you're keying it in. Yeah. Um, I've had really good luck actually getting the information in the non-Latin script from a website and just doing a copy and paste and save and seeing if Coho will take it, and it often does. Okay. I'll try that, yeah. We don't get too many books like that here, so. Thank you. Oh, of course. Thanks for bringing that up. The link I have to a Japanese record, I believe that was brought into our catalog. Double check. But I think that might have been pre-migration. No, it's it's new. That that one was brought into our catalog from OCLC as well. So Fred, now that you're here, 
Uh, Bruce had a question about modifying some records that were incorrectly coded LCC and uh, whether mark edit would be a good option or the mark modification templates and you have a lot more experience with mark edit than I do. You're probably on mute. Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, what, what is it that you want to change? Uh, sorry, the, the uh, 942? Yes. Uh, no, it's one of the 900s though. Okay. Um, what I would do, uh, which is the way I know how, this is not necessarily the best way, uh, export all the records that you want to change. Can you do that easily? I don't know yet. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> Export them and then just do um, uh, either add or replace field. Um, and then import them back in. Um, I haven't used the COA modification very much. Um, uh, they're probably a better way, but everything, when you have a nail, everything looks like a hammer. Yeah. If it's a field in the item record, I've used the batch item modification a lot and I love it. And yeah, when I uh, migrated our catalog over to um, COA, nothing had a 942 field because I didn't know about them. So any day now, uh, let's see, I think we've had this going seven oh. years. Uh, I'll just export all the item, you know, item types by type and modify it, bring it back in on a test site first. Yeah, Jay Tate chimes in in the chat. They've used Mark at it. Um, yeah, any, anything you'd like to tell us about it would be great. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I mostly would export them out and then open them in Mark Edit and make the changes in Mark Edit and then import them back in and replace those. Well, Bruce, you now have two people with that idea. Yeah, so apparently Thank you for I backing me up. to climb that learning curve on Mark Edit. <laughs> um, Terry Reese has done a lot of uh, shelter in place videos. Um, how to use various facets of Mark Edit, uh, which uh, I really need to watch one of these days. They're excellent. Yeah. They really are. I learned so much and was able to start playing with things right away. Guess I'll have to give that a try. Uh, anyone who's seen my uh, Wall of Knives presentation, uh, knows, you know, it, it really does an awful lot of stuff. Um, including stuff I will probably never understand at all. I need to learn regular expressions. Me too. I really want to learn more about regular expressions. Um, also, the Mark Edit email discussion list is full of really friendly people, and I think that Terry Reese never sleeps because he also usually chimes in with a very helpful answer to questions. I did not know there was such. Good. Yeah. Um, I'll try to make a point of adding to the, uh, the chat transcript. So for the comments for our YouTube, I'll add the subscription information for some of the discussion lists we've mentioned. AutoCAT, OCLC CAT, the main Coho list, the Mark Edit list, the Coho US email list. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have to look it up. I know what it says. 
<laughs> I love that cartoon, Fred. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yes. I took a library carpentry workshop from uh, the Carpentries group, and this is another thing I'll, I'm going to try to put into the chat. And we learned something about regular expressions, and wow. Really powerful. Um, I just recently started my job here at the College for Creative Studies, but prior to that I was at ProQuest, um, and I worked on the Early English Books product. And right before Ooh. I, yeah, right before I left, we got a major customer complaint from the school um, regarding the records, um, and they had sent us this giant report that they had created in Mark Edit using regular expressions that was able to just identify like these very like, nitty gritty um, errors that you know <laughs> we hadn't even thought about. So they are very powerful <laughs> to our detriment. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here from Leanne. Can you start dabbling with Mark Edit on your own, or should you tell your systems person or director? Um, I dabble uh, because when you export records from Koha, you're exporting a copy. Why not dabble and play? Um, I would talk to people before putting them back in and replacing them and overlaying them because that's where you can have some issues. <laughs> right, JJ says she is, that's me too. It's like I'm, I'm the cataloger and the system administrator, but uh, yeah, but also I'm supported by Bywater. So I also ask them for a lot of help and a lot of questions. And also we have our group here where one can bring questions as well, as well as the market at discussion list, that sort of thing. So I would encourage everyone to check out Terry Reese's videos and uh, go ahead and do some, some dabbling. Let me get the link to his site. Is if you, well, first of all, um, yeah, um, dabbling with Mark Edit as long as you're not using the main catalog information, just go ahead, uh, make a copy of something and work on it. Uh, right now, um, oh, I guess I can say this, even though. When, Let's just say our catalog uh, is in a place where it's very easy to back up and spin up another copy. And Koa is pretty easy to break if you um, are fiddling with templates. So you always need, just always work in a copy. <clears throat> but the regular Koa, no, not uh, very robust. As long as you're working on a copy, it, it doesn't matter what you do. If you wipe out the entire database, oh well. <laughs> That's how I learned. I just kept reinstalling it from a DVD. I guess uh, what we're all here for is to try to convince people Koa is not that scary. Uh, our former system came with you know, binders, a whole wall full, okay, shelf full. Uh, Koa doesn't. It also comes with such a big, helpful, friendly community, which I, I think can have drawbacks in that it is so diverse and dispersed that it seems like there's always something I didn't know about. But on the other hand, uh, so many friendly folks to just bring up and ask and say, hey. I think there's several reasons we're all here, but that's uh, here at Koha, I mean, but uh, 
it's hardly remarkable. Yeah. Well, and also if folks are gonna uh, dabble with Mark Edit and dabble with Koha and they would like to experiment with having a copy of Koha, I'm gonna make a pitch for Fred's presentations at various conferences. They're, they're very useful, very helpful, very step-by-step. -step. Oh, you're still muted, Fred. Try that, okay. Um, if you want to test database, uh, my boss has no problems with me just zipping up the whole thing and send it, sending it to you. Great. Or once I get my own collection, a little better catalog, you could have that, except for the uh, rare books and special collections and the signed stuff. I don't want people know I have that. Oh, and in a few weeks, I'm going to be doing my uh, Koa on a Raspberry Pi presentation for New Zealand. Uh, it's a lot simpler than this, this year than it was last year. And I'll make that image available. So just get a Raspberry Pi. Um, let's see. I have three of them here. Cool. Uh, and up the, uh, make a copy of the SD card. You got your own code instance to play around with. You're making me feel old, Fred. I remember when, rather than holding three computers in my hand, it took three trucks to hold one computer. I remember those days too. <coughs> Just asthma. It's all the um, mold and tree stuff out in the woods here. Yeah, my first computer was, um, let's see, 8080? I remember 8080s. I also remember getting a, a 3D6SX with 89 megabyte hard drive. I knew I'd never fill that up. Okay, a few months later, spent I'm not sure how many hundred dollars to get another 89 megabyte hard drive. Because then the 486 came out, which was so exciting. Yep, 32 gigabytes, $10. Right? <laughs> Well, I put a link in the chat to uh, Kohakon 2020 in New Zealand. I really encourage everyone to attend. It's going to be uh, available online. Yeah, I think I'm going to record my entire presentation and send it over. Uh. Yeah, the Koha US conference had some presentations like that, that um, they were recorded ahead of time, they played the recording, and then the presenters were available in the live YouTube chat for Q&A. Yeah, I'm not sure when our presentations will be on. I know Lisette is doing one. Um, Okay, where'd you get that ringtone? <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, I downloaded uh, the Star Trek <laughs> sound for my ringtone. <laughs> it's It has the advantage that I can tell in a bus back when we used to take the bus places that it was actually my phone ringing. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of free Star Trek sounds that are great. Uh, okay. 
I'm going to use a bit of the Twilight Zone theme in mine. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if anybody else has any cataloging things to chat about. If we've kind of done in cataloging, what I might do is stop the recording and then we can just chat if folks would like to stick around for some chat and social. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So uh, folks who really need to